have Evan Schneider joining us from Princeton, where she is a Hubble Fellow slash Lyman Spitzer Fellow. Um, uh, Evan got her PhD in 2017 from the University of Arizona, where she worked with Brent Robertson. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Evan for the first time this summer at a CGM meeting, um, and her work is extremely exciting. But I already knew about her because uh, when uh, Brant went to the meeting that Juna and Andrew uh, organized several years ago, I remember Juna coming back and in her often uh, uh, loudish voice in the hall, being like, this is great, new theorist. So anyway, the great new theorist is here um, to come give a talk. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to hear about the origin of multi-phase galaxy outflows. Yeah. Thank you for us. yeah, well, thank you so much for having me here. This is, as I've told several of you today, my first visit to uh, to the observatories, and I found it to be a very pleasant place to be. So, um, so yeah, it's it's really great to be here. Um, Give us time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, so, so today I'm going to talk. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that I've been pursuing um, primarily since starting my postdoc um, at Princeton. Um, but it is work that I am doing in collaboration with with Brandt um, and also with Todd Thompson. And uh, you know, I've I've put a sort of large, vague title up here: the origin of multiphase galaxy outflows. Um, and maybe by the end of the talk, you'll you'll agree that I you know have made some interesting comments about about how these sorts of um, systems are formed. Uh, this rendering that you can see um, in the background actually is a rendering from one of our simulations, um, and it was done as I'll as I'll get to a little bit later um, with a, a you know a fantastic piece of rendering software on GPUs. I didn't build that particular piece of software, but it's something we're now trying to integrate with our simulation code. Unfortunately, that happened very recently, so the rest of the images you see in the, in the talk will not be as good at the, as this, but as sort of a teaser, if I make it all the way to the end, you'll get to see the video that this rendering came from. So that's a, you know, impetus for us to, to try to get through the whole talk. Um, so, uh, yeah, so. Um, Without further ado, <laughs> right? Uh, why should you care about galactic galactic winds? Why should you care about outflows at all? Um, so, as as a theorist, I sort of come at this from a, from a theoretical perspective, which is just that you know outflows of gas from galaxies are absolutely necessary in order to reproduce. The, the properties of galaxies that we see. And so this was realized very early um, from you know, the perspective of people doing cosmological simulations. If you don't have some way of getting gas back out of galaxies to counteract the gravity that's dragging it in, you will get many, many properties of systems wrong. For example, you won't be able to fit the stellar mass function of galaxies at any redshift. That's what's being shown in this plot here. Um, you know, these are just several of the large scale simulations. This plot's a couple years out of date, but point being, in order to fit this function, you have to have winds. Um, and they also, you know, they, they are responsible for, for producing other, other properties that you might care about. For example, um, you might care about how the actual process of star formation regulation within the galaxies is taking place. That depends very sensitively on the feedback. Um, you might care about the, you know, the circumgalactic medium, the gas that's outside of galaxies. How, how do metals escape galaxies where they're formed and pollute the, the circumgalactic medium and the intergalactic medium and, and many other processes related to galaxy evolution depend sensitively on what's happening um, in, in these outflows. Okay, so given that I've just told you that they're very important, why haven't we solved the problem of understanding them? Um, and one reason is, of, of course, they're very complex. So this is um, you know, just one of the most spectacular images of M82, I think, that you can find. Um, and that's partly because it incorporates data from multiple different telescopes. And that allows you to look at the sort of multi-phase nature of this wind. So M82 is a starbursting galaxy. There's a, a nuclear starburst that's driving an outflow. We see that outflow um, in the center in, in in hard x-rays, this is measuring 10 million plus degree Kelvin plasma. That can be associated directly you know, with, with uh, the actual um, ejecta of supernovae themselves. Um, but you also see it in soft x-rays, sort of tracing million Kelvin degree gas. And that tends to be fairly coincident also with where you see optical line emission in H-alpha that's 
that's tracing the sort of 10 to, 10 to the 4 Kelvin uh, ionized phase. If we look in, in molecular gas, in neutral gas, we also see those phases. So, so this truly is a system where you have gas at you know, a very broad range of temperatures. Um, and that, that makes it challenging to model um, from an, uh, an analytic perspective and, and from a simulation perspective. Um, I think there are also a couple of interesting observational facts that have come to light in recent years that make out outflows interesting to study. One is that we've, we've learned, uh, contrary to what might have been expected in the simple paradigm of galaxy formation, that uh, galaxy halos, the circumgalactic medium, it's just littered with cool gas, where cool gas means, you know, say, neutral hydrogen or 10 to the 4 Kelvin photoionized gas. Um, and you might not necessarily expect this, because if the virial temperature of the halo is high enough, you might expect gas to fall in, get shocked, and then have very long cooling time, and, and why would there be any cool gas there at all? Um, and so I think one of the questions that this, these, this work might help explain is where the cool gas that, that is in galaxy halos comes from. And in fact, if, if that cool gas is formed by different processes depending on the type of galaxy that it's around or where in the halo you find it. Uh, we also know that, that cool gas exists in, uh, in the outflows. Um, and in fact, this is, this is showing absorption line spectra from a stacked sample of galaxies um, by, by Ben Wiener uh, at about redshift of one. And so what this is showing, you know, if you look at the systemic redshift of the galaxy that comes from the oxygen two line, and you compare that to the absorption feature in this magnesium two doublet, you can see that the, the velocities in this cool phase uh, extend out to, in this particular sample, we're seeing you know, maybe 600 kilometers a second. In other work, people have shown that this cool gas can be traveling at 1,000 kilometers a second. Um, so that's, that's interesting, and you might think, ah, well, here, here is an explanation for the cool gas that we see in the halos. You just take it out of the galaxy and push it out there, and, and then you know, there, you've solved it. But uh, from a theoretical perspective, that particular argument doesn't seem to work very well. So uh, in, a, in a series of simulations that I did as part of my PhD work, we tested exactly that model. We said, all right, if you have a cool gas cloud, in our case, we took gas clouds that had a, a turbulent density distribution um, to try to get it the sort of log normal structure. Um, and then you hit it with a, with a hot wind, um, presumably the kind of wind that you have in the background state in these outflows. Can you accelerate the cool material to the velocities that are seen um, in typical outflows? So here's what happens if you do that. Um, you can see that we do, you know, you, you, the shock propagates through the cloud, it starts to break up, you get all of these filamentary structures, but essentially you don't do a very good job of accelerating cool gas. What you do a really good job of is mixing cool gas into the hot phase and then that intermediate density stuff gets carried away. Um, and so, so this model alone doesn't seem to be able to reproduce the structures that are seen in outflows. And, and certainly this wouldn't be a good method for carrying cool gas all the way from a galaxy out into its halo. So the work that sort of motivated the project that I've been doing is how we could build a, a coherent theory of galaxy outflows that's able to explain all of these different observations. And so in particular, uh, it would need to reproduce the multi-phase nature of the outflows, since that seems to be a feature that is consistently seen. Uh, explaining the velocity structure of the outflows actually seems to be one of the more constraining pieces of information we have about what model might actually make physical sense. Uh, it should efficiently transport metals out of the galaxies because we need to get those metals all the way out into the CGM and beyond. And ideally, uh, something I've been thinking about more lately is how it could help us explain the observations of the multiphase gas in, in the circumgalactic medium. Okay, so the problem 
well, my dark blue doesn't really show up here, but imagine a sphere that goes all the way around. <laughs> um, so the problem is that, is that simulating these outflows is very challenging, and it's a problem of dynamic range. Um, we think that outflows, um, at least the ones I'm going to be talking about, are driven by supernovae. Supernovae, of course, are happening you know, in the region of star clusters. Um, an individual supernova could have a cooling radius of order a parsec. The clusters themselves then could drive winds that are on the scales of the galactic disk, so that's already a thousand times larger. And if you want to go you know, all the way out into the CGM and trace, trace this gas, then you have to go another factor of 100. And the issue, of course, is that you would say, all right, well, we'll just use uh, you know, a Lagrangian code or an adaptive mesh code so we can focus the resolution where we need it. The problem is that more and more observations are pointing towards the fact that there's going to be parsec scale structure at all of these scales. Um, and so in order to actually accurately reproduce all of these phases, you can't get away with just sacrificing resolution in some areas and focusing it in others. Um, and so this, is, this really is a challenge because um, with current codes, with current architectures, you know, we, we cannot simulate 100 kiloparsec volume with one parsec resolution. Um, and so what we're looking into with this project is sort of how far we can go towards that and, and understanding what the limitations are and, and where we can go in the future. So the tool that I'm using to approach this problem is a code that I wrote as part of my PhD thesis. It's called CHOIA, and CHOIA stands for Computational Hydrodynamics on Parallel Architectures. Um, CHOIA is a, a species of cactus that's native to the Sonoran Desert, so it was a very regional name. Um, and the idea behind CHOIA was that we have these systems that are being built, these supercomputers, and they rely on this entirely new architectural paradigm, which is the GPU, the graphics processing unit. Um, and the reason that it's really different is because graphics processing units are massively parallel. So in contrast to a CPU, which has nowadays maybe a few pretty powerful cores, a GPU has thousands of not particularly powerful cores. And so if you can formulate a problem in a way that takes advantage of this massive parallelism, you can speed up the calculations by, by large amounts. Um, and so I wrote this code to, to, try to try to take advantage of that power. Um, it's a publicly available code, so if you have GPUs and you're interested in trying it out, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, it's you know, a state-of-the-art code in terms of the hydrodynamics we employed. We don't have to cut any corners. One of the advantages of GPUs is that the more calculations you can do per memory access, the better off you are. Um, and so things that people used to try to sort of cut back on in hydrodynamics calculations, like doing exact solutions to um, you know, Riemann problems or uh, the order of your spatial reconstruction, we basically just you know, push that as far as we want because it's, it's advantageous to do that. Um, there's something else that I won't have time to talk about at all today, but um, we found a really neat technique for accelerating the radiative cooling calculations that has to do with taking advantage of the, the native hardware on the GPU to do bilinear interpolations. So if you do bilinear interpolations and, and have reasons to want to make them faster, it's like blazing fast and just, it's a cool, cool application. So that's something else you could, you could chat with me about. Um, okay, so, that's all I'm really gonna say about the details of the code, but of course, if it's something you're interested in, you should talk to me because I spent a lot of time on it. Um, and after could... the talk and after she gets the video, I have an anecdote that I'm suppressing so that we can get to the video. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll remind you <laughs> um, once we go into social time. Okay, so, uh, right, so, so the point of, of building this code, uh, I mean, it's cool to be able to run large calculations on, on a laptop or a desktop, but really the point was to be able to take advantage of, of these supercomputers that are being being built. So for example, until very recently, the fastest open science supercomputer in the US, I say open science because undoubtedly Google has a bigger one, um, is Titan. This was a, the flagship machine at Oak Ridge. It had 18,000 nodes, each of which had a GPU. Um, and when it was 
built, it was the fastest computer in the world. It's now slid down to something like seven or eight. Terrible. Um, but that's okay because Oak Ridge just installed a new GPU-based supercomputer that is the fastest in the world. So, uh, so that's, you know, if you're patriotic, this is a point of pride in the HPC community. Um, we've taken the title back. So this computer, it's, I mean, it really is a, an astonishing machine. Um, in contrast to, to the previous machine, it actually has fewer nodes, but they've made them very GPU heavy. Um, and that's great for us because we actually don't use the CPUs really at all in our calculations. We've offloaded all of the hydrodynamics calculations onto the GPUs. So the more there are per node, the better. And so we actually tested Choya out on Summit and it works beautifully. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that's something we're really excited about being able to take advantage of in the future. Okay, so what can we do with these machines and with this code? So this gets me into the actual project I've been pursuing. So I called it Choya Galactic Outflow Simulations, somewhat contrived seagulls. And I was thinking like winds and birds and something. But um, <laughs> anyway, so, so, uh, so the first couple of papers uh, uh, about these simulations are out, so you can, you know, you can get more detail. Um, but it's an ongoing project, so much of what I'm going to talk about has not yet been published. I'm happy to chat about it. And there's more, more simulations and plenty more analysis to come. The idea was we want to take um, as large a region as we can around, around a galaxy and simulate this outflow. In this case, we've decided on 10 kiloparsecs by 10 kiloparsecs by 20 kiloparsecs. Um, within that, we place a disk roughly modeled after the parameters of M82. Um, so you get you know, several scale lengths of the gas disk within this box. Um, and then we're going to, in a very artificial way, inject mass um, and energy in this disk to sort of represent feedback and, and look at the properties of the outflow. And this is an incredibly idealized simulation. Our disk um, is a single phase, 10 to the 4K ISM. We're not trying to resolve star formation um, and do this in a self-consistent manner. We're really approaching this as sort of a series of simulations that step further and further away from analytic models um, in order to kind of get at what, what features matter and, and how those affect the large scale problem. Um, because we have such high resolution, um, we're able to achieve a maximum resolution of five parsecs, um, and that's throughout the entire volume. So that's something that has, has not been done before. Um, so getting it, this is just sort of a, you know, s since people might ask what are, what are our sort of general simulation characteristics, as I said, we use an isothermal gas disk. It's 10 to the 4K. We have a cooling floor of 10 to the 4K. So in these simulations, I'm not going to be talking about what happens with molecular gas. Um, people always have questions about dust. Um, that's also not something we're going to address. Uh, we have a static gravitational potential, so we run these simulations for about 75 million years, so we don't expect the gravitational potential to change very much. Um, and that consists of a stellar disk and a, and a dark matter halo. Um, we run all of the simulations at 5, 10, and 20 parsec resolution so that we can get at, at um, things like convergence and, and where we think we really have converged on properties and where we haven't. Um, this is all done uh, via uh, an, an allocation on Titan. Um, that's the Insight program. Yes. So, is this, where are the edges of this versus like an adaptive mesh sort of approach? Yeah. So, I'll I'll show you sort of in the in the videos later. But essentially, the issue is that what's setting the properties of these outflows um, at all radii are the interactions between the different phases of gas, and in particular things like Kelvin-Helmholtz shear instabilities between the cool clouds and the, and the warmer gas. And resolution really matters in capturing those interactions. And so there'll actually be large scale sort of phase changes that you wouldn't see if you decided to just de-refine everything that was lower density, um, which is effectively what AMR simulations do. They focus all of their resolution in the disk, the same with, with SPH or Lagrangian type, type uh, simulations. And so then you, you lose um, you know, a lot of the interesting stuff that's happening in, in the outflow. That was like a pretty cool numerical dig to use the word de-refined for the AMR. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, yeah, no, and I, you know, I. 
<laughs> I love I love AMR codes. I love Lagrangian codes. I think that they have done some really amazing things. Um, and people will often ask me, like, oh, are you going to make this an AMR code? And my answer is no, because the whole point was we want to address problems that you can't address with that strategy. Um, and people are starting to pick up on this. I mean, there have been simulations, a number of them in recent years, where people are taking AMR codes and just running them with a static mesh. So it's, this is something people have realized can, can matter. Um, OK. So um, right, a little bit about our feedback models, just so you understand what I'm talking about when I refer to the different ones. Um, like I said, they're very simple, um, and that's, that's by design. So we have a sort of central feedback model, and there we just dump all of the, of the mass and energy into a sphere in the center of the galaxy. We choose 300 parsec radius for that sphere so that we can compare um, at, in some ways against M82, um, where that's been sort of a model that's been used for that particular system. Um, and then there's clustered, and I have a couple different versions of the clustered feedback, but the idea there is that rather than putting it all in a sphere, we actually distribute it in an anisotropic way um, and, and see how that, how that changes the solution. Um, okay, right, and so we're gonna vary different parameters of this feedback also and, and try to address how that changes the character of the flow. So in all of the simulations, we sort of follow this, this typical um, evolution in that the things that we're prescribing basically are the star formation rate in a, in a very sort of uh, prescriptive way. Like I said, we're not actually tracking star formation, so I just say for the first 35 million years, the star formation is 20 solar masses per year, and then if I assume how many supernova they are, there are per unit star formation, and I assume something about how that energy couples to the ISM, that's where this alpha comes in, um, that's, the, that's the energy loading factor. It allows you to relate the energy injected in the wind to the mass formed in stars. Um, and then uh, a similar assumption gets made about how the mass in the ISM gets coupled um, to the mass in the wind, and this is on small scales. That's your beta, the mass loading factor. Um, then I just, I prescribe all three of those um, for the simulations, and so they all follow this sort of general pattern of we have a high star formation, high mass loading phase, and followed by a low uh, star formation, low mass loading phase, and that's just so that we can get you know, sort of more than one representative solution out of a, out of a given simulation. Kinetic so in this case, I put it in, in kinetic energy, um, but as you'll see from the solutions, it, 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 I mean, it very quickly turns into kinetic energy in the winds. Okay, so what does one of these simulations look like? So these were the first ones that we performed, um, and one of the things that you'll find is, as these go on, the, the sort of visualizations get better because we were sort of adding this in as we went. So for this simulation, you have on-axis projections. Um, this is the density, um, and on, on the right, you have the temperature. And the idea here was this is the simplest model that we're gonna run, we're going to just do central feedback, and we're going to only include adiabatic physics. So there's no radiative cooling in this simulation. All right, so if I actually start the simulation running, okay, there it starts to go. Um, we start the feedback at five million years. You can see, all right, you can actually pick out the sphere where we're injecting this energy. It sends this shock out into the, into the surrounding CGM, and then it actually sets up this kind of nice, almost biconical outflow structure at early times, but as time goes on, you start interacting with the gas in the disk because this is an adiabatic simulation. There's nowhere for the energy to go, so it starts to go into generating turbulence at the disk interface. That turbulence starts to propagate out into the outflow itself. Around here is where we change those parameters, the alpha and the beta and the star formation rate, you can see that changed the general character of the outflow. So when you have more mass in the wind, even in the adiabatic simulation, it tends to be cooler and slower moving. At later times, you have a, a hotter, faster wind. Um, and you can see that you know this, this, because again, it's an adiabatic simulation, you end up with a very flared disk, um, and you end up with all of this interesting turbulent structure in the flow. Okay, so, one of the reasons we did such a simple calculation, um, 
uh, actually, sorry. One, uh, one just quick sort of to give you a perspective. Um, these are slices through the, through the um, midplane of this simulation. And so you can see in sort of density structure, you can see the density ranges that, that we're going over. Um, these are just picking out those different, um, those different evolutionary states that I was talking about. So right at early times, we have this shock propagating out into CGM. This is actually like a very nice validation of you know, a shock model where you can actually see the forward shock, you can see a contact discontinuity, you can see the reverse shock. Um, and then, like I said, you get this biconical structure at later times. And then when you have um, less pressure in the outflow, uh, you know, this, this turbulence starts to sort of cave in and, and you have more of a cylinder um, as opposed to a bicone. Okay, so one of the reasons we did this, this calculation um, is because one of the sort of standard analytic models, one of the earliest models that was, uh, that was described for these winds is the Chevalier and Clegg model. And that assumes adiabatic hydrodynamics. It neglects gravity, it neglects radiative cooling. There's no additional sources of momentum. But the idea is that it's described by exactly the parameters that we have control over in this simulation. You have a sphere, you inject mass and energy into that sphere, that's your m dot and your e dot. And then if you also you know, have the radius of that sphere, you can exactly predict what the properties of the outflow should be as a function of radius. Um, this is just to remind you that in this case, this m dot can be related to the star formation rate as can the e dot. Okay. And so this is you know, what those solutions look like, generally speaking. Here, R is how far out you are in the outflow. Big R is the radius where you've injected. You can see it goes through a sonic point at, uh, at um, R, of, R of 1. And that's actually really important because one of the reasons that this model is so famous is that it described a supersonic outflow. And if you want to get metals way out of a galaxy, you've got to have a supersonic flow. You have to be able to get it, get it moving really fast. Um, you can see that you know, also as you're moving outward, of course, there's adiabatic expansion. So the density and, and the pressure are dropping. So we can actually compare that simulation directly to this model. Um, here, I mean, I've played a little bit of a trick because I'm not taking all of the gas in the outflow. I'm kind of just focused on that central region where things looked, looked nice. Um, but actually, that's, that's very validating because then we can see here, I've plotted in white the actual solution to the Chevalier and Clegg model given the parameters we set. And the dashed colored lines show you the averages that we get from our simulation. And you can see that they follow, they follow this model exactly. The only deviation is in the velocity, which makes sense because we have the gravitational potential and Chevalier and Clegg does not. Okay, so that was great. Um, this was you know, sort of a, a good validation of what we were doing. You might ask if there's any practical value to an adiabatic simulation. Um, the answer is actually maybe it not, it's not a bad description, at least of the hot phases of the current state of the M82 outflow. So as sort of a sanity check, I made this um, surface brightness map um, of the, of the X-ray emission in M82. It's a very simple calculation, so I wasn't actually expecting necessarily to get, get it right, but then I compared it to the surface brightness, well, a fit to the surface brightness profile in M82. That's the yellow line was just a, a best fit exponential um, from, uh, from Strickland uh, 2004. And what you can see is actually it, it's, it's pretty good. Um, and in terms of the total luminosity, we're only off by something like a factor of two, which no other simulation has been able to reproduce this luminosity to within a factor of 10. So that was also um, kind, of a, kind of a nice thing to come out of this. Um, so this is, again, an indication that, that, uh, that we're moving in the right direction. All right, but what I was really interested in you know, was, was this cool gas and how do you get cool gas in outflows. And so one of the things that got me interested in this was this model that, that uh, Todd Thompson and, and Elliot Quadert and, and others um, came up with, I think actually maybe directly as a result of these conferences. <laughs> um, and so the idea was, well, under the right circumstances, you've got this supernova-driven outflow. Maybe you have some of these cool clouds that are near the base of the outflow, but they're getting destroyed. And as they're getting destroyed, that's adding mass into the hot phase of the wind. And so you should then be able to calculate you know, a cooling time for that wind that is some function of these parameters, the energy loading and the, and the mass loading factor. And this, you know, sort of sensibly, if you have 
more mass, so beta is higher, the cooling time is shorter, um, and, and vice versa. Similarly, there's an advection time scale for this wind as it's moving outward that also is a function of beta and alpha, and there the relationship goes in, in the opposite direction um, because alpha is, is you know, the energy, tells you how fast the wind's going, more energy, faster wind. And so if you equate these two, you can come up with a radius where the wind should cool provided um, beta is, is large enough relative to alpha. And when Todd plugged in some sort of reasonable-ish numbers, he came up with cooling radii that were of order a few kiloparsecs. And so the thought was, well, maybe this mechanism actually could produce um, fast-moving cool gas in winds. I won't talk too much about, about you know, how this propagates on out into the halo, but that's also an interesting question um, that I'm happy to, to discuss with people. Okay, so simulation number two is basically our direct test of this model. How, does, how well does this work? Um, so same parameters as model one, we've just turned on radiative cooling. So first you have this hot shock that goes out, but you can see at high mass loading states, relatively quickly you develop exactly this structure. You get a cooling radius. Outside of the cooling radius, all of the gas is at our temperature floor of 10 to the 4 Kelvin. When we change the parameters, the cooling radius should go away, and so it does. It moves outward, and you see at late times that you have this hot, fast outflow. Um, and this is exactly what we were expecting based on the model. In fact, we chose alpha and beta based on the analytic expectation. So the, 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 uh, the schematic is when the mass loading factors go down, the gas, the ambient gas, gets hotter. It's both that it gets hotter and that it's moving faster because basically in these outflows you have this competition between adiabatic expansion, which is lowering the density, and radiative cooling, which goes as the density squared. And so if you can get enough mass into the outflow before it's expanded too much, it'll cool. Exactly. The second term wins. Right. Uh, the density term wins. Okay, but if right. you don't get enough mass out. Then it, it expands too rapidly and the density drops and you no longer have efficient cooling. Yeah, that's the idea. So it's, it's really not that the gas, the, thinking about it as the gas heating up is incorrect. It's, it's that the cooling radius is really. Well, I mean, it both are. Moving out. It's more, yeah, I, I tend to think of it as cooling radius is moving out. Although at some, at some point, these, these uh, analytic descriptions do break down. You can't carry that forever. But the gas temperature is also important because the hotter it is, you know, the further you have to climb down that cooling curve. Um, and, and that matters. So. Um, yeah, so, so that is, it's important too. That really comes in with the, the radius, plays a role in this, in this calculation as well. All right, so then just to sort of, again, highlight these, these different phases, um, similar structure at early times, although you'll note there's a lot less turbulence at the interface, and that's, that's basically because the energy that would be driving that turbulence is just being radiated away because this disk interface is, is very high density. Um, when we have this cooling outflow, if you just do the hand wavy um, calculation of where the cooling radius should sit, it sits where this dashed line is, which is, I, I would say, almost stunningly accurate given that there were some assumptions that went into that model, things like power law cooling functions and, and, and limits. Um, and so actually, I think this, this is a really nice demonstration of how well that particular method works. Um, and then, as I said, at late times, you, know, you, you expect this cooling radius to, to disappear, and it does. Um, again, if we compare to, to the actual model in terms of the, you know, the radial description of this outflow, uh, it's, it does a very nice job. So the solid line is the original Chevalier and Clegg model. The dashed line is Todd's calculation when you include cooling. Um, and you can see that it, you know, it follows the, the properties that we get pretty well. We, we end up you know, at a higher temperature because we set this cooling floor. But, um, but this was, this was also a nice validation. Todd was very pleased when I wrote to him and showed him this plot. So. Okay, so that's great, but the power of the simulations, of course, is that we can move beyond the analytic models and describe scenarios that are very difficult to, to describe analytically. And so that's where we went with simulation number three. 
And the idea here is we wanted to keep as much the same as we could. So we keep the same mass loading and the same energy loading. And we even put it in the same volume. But instead of a 300 parsec radius sphere, I'm going to put it into eight spheres. And they each have a radius of 150 parsecs. Turns out to be the same volume. OK. Uh, so here, again, density on the left, temperature on the right. You can see the little spheres in the temperature plot. Um, and as things get going, what you'll see is the large scale structure of the wind does again undergo this, this, uh, you know, this cooling. Um, but on small scales, there's just a ton of additional structure. In fact, um, you know, I kind of think I sort of overshot in this model because you can see we basically just blew out all of the ISM from the center of the galaxy. Um, uh, although maybe that's an interesting constraint on, on actually what, you know, what star formation rates or something could be. Um, at late times, though, again, because we're setting the mass loading and the energy loading in these clusters by hand, you do see the background state evolve in a similar way to the way it did in, in previous simulations. But you still have all of this cool stuff littering the outflow at much, much smaller scales. How yeah. you the boundary? Is, it's is it outflow. Yeah, it's just outflow. Okay. So actually, that's. Um, one of the limitations of this is that I can't turn the outflow off because people always say, well, if it stopped, would it fall back in? And the answer is, well, some of it certainly would, but also my simulation would crash. <laughs> what should the inflow look like? Um, yeah, and so, so this, was, this was really interesting, right? Because the only thing we changed was the way we put this, where, you know, where we put this mass and energy, and we got just a really different looking outflow. Um, and you can see, if we look at the slices, this is a total mess. Um, at early times, maybe you can see individual regions that are following these sort of analytic structure. But as soon as you dump all of this, all of this ISM gas in there, then it becomes, you know, it becomes much, much more complicated. You can kind of see, you kind of do get a multi-phase outflow even at larger radii because you've got these shocks around the clouds that are happening. Um, but this, you know, this is still in that sense of a large scale cool outflow. At later times, maybe maybe it actually looks more like something like MIDI 2 where we see this hot hot phase near the center, but also all of this other stuff entrained. So, you know, I thought this was really interesting um, from the perspective of, of what just happens if you put a bunch of ISM gas in. And one of the things that you know I'm interested in is how this model looks in terms of things like velocity space and, and, and the density structure in these sort of radially average quantities. So again, this is just showing those sorts of averages. But what you can see is, in addition to plotting sort of the median and the mean, I've also plotted these percentiles, um, 25th and 75th percentiles, so you can get a feel for you know, where most of the gas is. These are volume weighted. So you can actually see, for example, in the density, the mean is actually above the, the 25th percentile because there is a lot of high density stuff out there that's just not occupying very much of the volume. Um, and so, so that's, you know, that's why you get these elevated means relative to the, the additional percentiles. This obviously did produce a lot of cool gas moving it at fast, um, at fast speeds. Um, but again, you can tell because the mean's lower, there's also a lot of cool gas in this simulation moving at low speeds. So this is kind of nice because it indicates that maybe there's actually two sort of separate origins for the, the cool gas that we see in these outflows and, and where they're moving. Some of it may be stuff that has been lofted out of the ISM and is moving relatively slowly because it's difficult to accelerate. Other stuff gets mixed and, and then cools back down. Um, so then, again, getting into the differences in structure at early times versus late times when we've changed these, um, we've changed these features. Uh, if you look at those same plots at late times, what you can see is actually that you know we've elevated the density in the outflow quite a bit, and this is a volume a volumetric plot. So even in even in that sort of volume filling space where you have hot outflow, it doesn't match the analytic model anymore because you've you've dumped so much extra stuff in it. There's a lot of mixing happening. Um, the velocities are are correspondingly lower than you would predict with the analytic model. The temperatures, interestingly, are actually much higher because you've got hot gas that's running into these clouds and shocking, and so you can get temperatures that are easily an order of magnitude above what you would expect from the analytic model. I think this is actually interesting because people have tried to use 
these sorts of models to get at alpha and beta in systems like M82. And if these interactions, these shock interactions are happening, which they certainly are, that might actually mean your inferences about alpha and beta are off because things like the temperature are, are affected by these interactions. Um, we were you know, really interested in how this multi-phase structure is generated because in the beginning it was sort of like Todd's model basically would say that all of this, these clouds are all mixed in at, at low radius and that's accounted for in our sort of subgrid clustered model in this case. And then if you have different regions of outflows interacting, can you produce a multi-phase outflow? So to kind of get at this, we ran a version of the simulation that doesn't have a disk at all. That's what this is. Um, and what you can see is that sure, actually some of some of the large scale structure might be formed just from these outflows interacting. In particular, the sort of shell-like structures or filamentary structures may be a result of this kind of process. Um, but it's certainly the case that the disk makes a big difference for the small scale structure. So a lot of the structure we're seeing is caused by the interaction between the feedback regions and the rest of the gas in the disk. Um, it's also the case that you know, we ran this no disk simulation at, at 20 parsec resolution um, and you know, we know that resolution makes a big difference because if we run, you know, this is the 20 parsec resolution version of our simulation, this is the five parsec resolution version, you can see there's actually a lot more cooling because we mixed in a lot more stuff because those interactions in the ISM are happening more efficiently. So this is something we're still trying to get a handle on is how resolution actually affects, affects these results. Okay, so that's, that's the, you know, okay, right. So this was, again, getting at that resolution um, and this is here just measuring mass in the outflow, the mass loading at a, at a, at a you know, over a series of radial bins, and you can see that in that particular version, we're very much not converged in terms of how much mass is in the outflow as, as a function of the resolution. But in fact, it's quite large relative to um, what you would infer based on the sort of star formation rate. Okay, but these are actually, the, the newest simulations I think um, kind of shifted the way that I've, I've thought about this, and so to set the stage, we were, in all of the previous simulations, we were setting alpha by hand, we were setting beta by hand, and we were, we were leaving them basically constant. I only changed them after 35 million years. In fact, of course, that's not how clustered feedback works. You have a star cluster, maybe it lives for, for 30 million years, or at least that's how long you expect you know, massive stars to be exploding. Um, but it's going off in, in a two-phase ISM, and really what you expect to be happening is a lot of mixing at early times as that, that cluster is expanding, you know, the bubble from that cluster is expanding outwards. And then at some point, it breaks out of the disk, and after that, you expect the mass loading to be much, much lower because you've kind of gotten rid of all of the ISM gas that was in that region. And correspondingly, you might also expect that the energy loading goes way up once you've broken out of the disk because you're no longer interacting with as much ISM. You're not radiating all that energy away. And so my thought with this simulation was, all right, well, we'll do some sort of subgrid calculations of that interaction between a cluster and a two-phase ISM, and we'll measure what the mass loading and energy loading should be as a function of time, and then we'll use that as our feedback model in these simulations. And so, so when we do that, and, and I, you know, I changed a couple of other things. I have 20 clusters and, instead of eight clusters, and you know, they're, they're rotating with the disk. It basically just got a little bit more physically realistic. Um, but what I found when I did this was actually that it changes the character of the outflow a lot. And what you'll see is these things start to go off. You can see at, at first there are these regions where you get these sort of dense clumps of cooling gas. I think those can be directly associated with these high mass loading rates that only uh, exist for a short period of time um, because you expect that clump to cool and then afterwards the, the energy loading is high. But as time goes on, you, you've been dumping more and more stuff out. You are still interacting with the disk gas and you're starting to eat away at the gas in the disk. And you can get pretty large scale cool gas structures in this outflow. And this is a totally different process than what I was showing in the previous simulation where the large scale cool structures either came sort of monolithically or because we had a huge clump of ISM that was being being dumped out. Um, in this case, you know, all of these cool structures basically are coming 
from this sort of death rebirth process for, for the cool gas, where near the disk itself, these clouds get shredded, they then mass load the hot phase, but this is happening on small scales, and so then they cool out into these small scale structures. Um, but then, of course, if you have regions where there's a lot of those small scale structures, they can combine and form these much, much larger scale cool structures. Sure. Um, so that's a great question. Um, cooling is, of course, metallicity dependent. We assumed solar metallicity for everything. We're not tracking metallicity in the gas explicitly. Um, so that may have an effect, but actually what I was just saying kind of mitigates that effect because the really high metallicity stuff is that hot, you know, that hot gas. The lower metallicity stuff is the ISM, but they're all mixing together, and so actually, um, if I just move on to this next slide, you can see this effect. So one of the other differences between these simulations is in addition to, to tracking you know, the variables we were tracking previously, here I'm showing density and temperature slices, I added in a, a passive scalar, that's this color variable, and the idea there was just we set that value to one for gas that we're injecting artificially, and we set it to zero for gas that was already in the disk, and that allows us to sort of see in the outflow like how much mixing has taken place. And what you can see is that you know, by the time you get out to a couple of kiloparsecs, it's all mixed. So this is not gas that's just been directly accelerated out of the ISM, nor are there you know, regions where any of the high, you know, high velocity, low density stuff escapes. It all, it all gets mixed together. And basically this sort of broad scale um, mixing tells you kind of how much cooling there will be in the outflow. And so this was, this was um, I thought this was really interesting because it does have implications for things, um, things like the, you know, how the cooling proceeds, but also where, you know, where you expect metals to be in the halo, right? Because if I then, right, here's, here's a velocity slice, same, same, same deal. Um, you can see that the high velocity regions are the, the, you know, the high metallicity regions. And so there's been some indications perhaps actually that the metallicity in the outer parts of halos is maybe, maybe higher than in the inner parts, which seems strange um, since the metals are formed in the galaxy. But actually in this paradigm, that, that, that would explain it, right? Because the highest velocity stuff is also the highest metallicity. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is actually, this is not something, um, it's not that no one has thought of this particular model, um, but putting it all together, I think this is the first time that this has really been demonstrated. And so it's kind of a combination of you know, the idea, this idea of radiatively cooling hot winds, but it's not as simple, of course, as the, as the analytic picture that, that was presented in, in Thompson et al. 2016. And actually there was a paper I showed originally that sort of cloud wind interaction simulation. Um, and you know, other people have done those types of simulations. We all basically conclude that it's very difficult to accelerate cool gas. But there's a paper, a letter out earlier this year by Max Gronke and Peng Oh, where they, they suggested that this kind of process works if, you know, if your clouds are large enough, basically. That rather than accelerating cool gas, really, maybe what you do is you mix cool gas and then, and then it, it, you know, it reforms into these small clouds further out. And, and that's, that's totally, you know, we look at the size scales of these things and they're very, very small. Um, so that seems like it actually might be a viable option. And I think this is really interesting because also, you know, as this process is taking place, you're mixing and then you're cooling and then you're mixing and then you're cooling. You're also, you know, in a sense, accelerating the cool gas. So the cool gas is moving faster at, at, at farther, farther radii, which means it should get out to the inner halo. Um, and this, this could be a source of, of all of the you know, small-scale cool gas structure in, in the inner regions of the halos. Sure. So, <laughs> um, so one of the things that I think is another way to use these calculations is to understand, and you alluded to this earlier, how going from an observed quantity to a theoretical quantity is challenging. So the way you did this was not by putting in alpha. And I wonder if you've taken these things and had, you know, made actual maps that can be converted into observable quantities right. to actually say, yeah. oh, we actually think that that's the covering fraction, but yep. you know. 
so we are working on it is the short answer. Yeah, so that's absolutely my, my one of my goals with this series of calculations was to produce some really nice data sets that will help inform observations um, via things like calculating covering fractions as a function of velocity. Um, and I am working with a student on, on starting to do that. Uh, it, it turns out this insight program is, I mean, it's, amazing because we have so much time, but also the government like really wants you to use your time on time. And so I've been sort of, uh, you know, I've been planning the next simulation and I haven't actually had time to do um, as much analysis, but that's where we're going with all of this, um, absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, just I've, I can throw up a few more plots of things we have started to look into. For example, you know, what, what does the mass distribution look like as a function of phase? Is it primarily, you know, in one phase or another? Basically, this is if I make a, you know, a um, mass weighted phase diagram, not including the disk gas, this is just stuff in the outflow. You can see there is a lot of mass at, at cooler phases, but there's also a lot of mass at all phases. Um, and, and converting things like this into ion ratios, I think is gonna be really interesting in the context of the, the things that are being seen in, in CGM studies. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll skip over this, but in that more recent simulation, the idea basically is the mass loading in the outflow is lower on the whole, but it also seems like we're much closer to being converged, which I find reassuring. Um, so these, these are not so different um, uh, compared to what, what we saw previously. I started this talk by, <laughs> by talking about the cool gas, so of course I've already sort of gotten at some of this, but you know, the question was, can you accelerate cool gas via this mechanism? And here, this is the volume weighted version of that histogram, the velocity as a function of radius again. But if I just do a temperature cut, which is essentially like mass weighting it, you can see that this does produce gas that's moving at this range of velocities. Um, and so that's, that's great because this was one of the, the questions we set out to answer was like, how can you get cool gas moving at you know, upwards of 600 kilometers a second. And this seems like a, a really um, robust mechanism for doing that. That's such an observery question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it looks like maybe it's kind of starting to asymptote to me, but uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it should be decelerating at some point, right? The outflow models themselves do start to decelerate as you get further out. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I would actually expect this to not, I don't think you're going to get above 1,000 kilometers a second. That's kind of nice, too, because that's kind of the maximum outflow velocity we see in cool gas um, for these, you know, sort of down the barrel observations. Um, yeah, and it's going to depend on the properties of the, of the starburst itself. So in more extreme systems, you might be able to get more extreme velocities. All those, yeah. All those cool little clouds that you have scattered throughout that volume, mm -hmm. uh, what fraction of the volume are they taking up? Right, so that's one of the things that I would like to directly measure <laughs> um, and have not done okay. yet. Um, so you can, I mean, you can answer it as well as I can at this point, because all I've done is sort of stare at this kind of plot. And your eyesight's um, probably better than mine. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. I mean, I can say it's a very small fraction, uh, right? It seems to be, right? Um, and, at, you know, this is at late times. At earlier times, it's a larger fraction. So the higher the, the density in the, in the um, gas overall, the larger fraction um, of that space you fill, but it's still a small fraction. Um, so this actually fits in pretty well with some of the more recent uh, theories about the CGM just being lots and lots of small clouds. I'm not sure that works further out um, for reasons I'd be happy to chat with people about. But for the inner CG around, CGM around star forming galaxies, this, this kind of fits in pretty well with that picture, I would say. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just leave up, no, I won't leave up my conclusions. I'll read you my conclusions so you can see the movie. Um, and so these are, I think I've touched on all of these things at this point. Um, I think we've pretty robustly shown that, that mass loaded winds can cool radiatively to, to 10 to the 4 Kelvin. And this, this is a, a viable mechanism for getting high velocity cool gas in outflows. Um, clustered supernova feedback produces winds that, that look, um, you know, they're energetic. You've got enough energy in the wind to account for, for the um, 
the flows that we see, and also they are mo they're, they're multi-phase. We see gas in all, all of these varieties of phases, um, and so that's you know, getting at this fact that the, the mass exists across this range of densities, but also that you know, this mass loading that happens near the base of the outflow from the cluster um, disk interaction is an, in a, is an efficient process. Um, it's the outflow, the mass that we're seeing in the outflow is not all put in by hand. A lot of that is, is coming from that, that process and it's not completely resolved even in these simulations. So we still do have work to do. Um, okay, so then this is a rendering. This is just density um, but sort of flying through a particular time snapshot of that, of that last simulation. One of the things I like about this, um, in addition to the fact that it just looks cool, um, is that as we get back down to the disk, you'll actually see there's these clumps of gas, right, like those. Those look qualitatively different than the gas in the outflow, and that's actually because those are the clumps that are being directly accelerated from the ISM, and you can see they only exist very close to the disk. Everything does get sort of shredded and mixed in and then cools back out into these higher density, small scale structures. Um, and so this is, you know, we've teamed up with some, some folks from NVIDIA who had this rendering software. We're trying to actually incorporate it with our code so that we could do on the fly visualizations like this of our simulations, which I think will be neat. But um, yeah, just, just something to look at in case, in case you're bored. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, I will finish with that, so. The difference between which simulations? Well, between the earlier simulations where you just had a single source. True. And the feedback, I think, was just constant in time. Or yep. Smoothly decreasing in time. Uh huh. As opposed to where you have clusters which then have you know, different time scales where they put in a lot of feedback. And then, right. You know, you know, that was so toxicity, I think. Uh, well, that, I mean, that's certainly playing a role. Um, but I'm not sure that's that's the major driver of the differences, like actually. Well, so the energy input actually is is pretty similar. Um, the mass. Uh, well, actually, so actually, just the energy input, because basically, for this cluster model. I assumed a, a really large cluster, basically a superstar cluster, um, and it breaks out of the disk within about 100,000 years. Um, and you'll note that you know, these simulations are running for millions of years. I leave the clusters on for millions of years. So the energy basically very quickly ramps up to the value that we had in the previous versions of the simulations. Well, so. I'm not putting in more energy in a short period of time. I am putting in more mass in a short period of time. I guess that's my point. Right, but that's that's actually more a function of the mass, the mass that's being dumped in. The energy input is pretty constant, but if we put in a lot of mass over a short period of time, then you know that that becomes a very cool flow, very close to the disk, and then then the mass loading is very low, and so then then you don't get that. So. Yeah, that's just to say that the energy input is actually far more constant than the mass input. If that so was helpful. My, so I have a few, well, I have a million questions, but I'll start with two. One is about like these these sort of outlier things. And I don't know to what degree you've looked at that, but this has come up in the context of you know things like neon eight and in the you know now sort of uh, not so state of the art simulations that some of us grew up on. Um, one of the things that we classic, always, I think, is <laughs> the term. Yeah, yeah that's a word. Um, one of the things we always worried about were interfaces between and like what funky ionization structures right. you get at those interfaces. Yeah. So that's one of my questions: is have you started? And I could see some of that in your your model, but have you guys dug into that at all to to see if you get any funky ionization structure right. at the interfaces? Yeah. So, you know, in the code itself, we don't assume any non-equilibrium. Um, chemistry, but 
in the post-processing, that's, that's one of the things that we are gonna look into is, right, if we, if we make assumptions about you know, how, how um, non-equilibrium these, these, um, these simulations could be, then how does that change the ionization structure and, and do we need to appeal to that? Because um, it's also possible that we could, we could get interesting results with equilibrium chemistry models just because we have so, much, so many more interfaces. Um, so we have a lot more intermediate temperature stuff than you would have if you did this at low resolution. So I think my, my sort of trajectory is to start assuming very simple equilibrium ionization models, see what we get in terms of ion ratios, and then, then see if you, know, if you, if you change something. Yeah, then, then does it. Yeah. So that was my first question. My second question is now that like you've sort of twiddle solved the CGM, have you started looking at the ISM in these calculations at all? And I know you're not consistently following you know, star formation and, and, and that kind of thing, but in terms of the violence that's being done to the disk. Right. Uh, well, so the short answer is no, um, but I guess a more interesting answer is that the last version of these simulations that I'm going to do, um, which will be finished by the end of the year, like it or not, um, is going to have a much more distributed version of this cluster feedback with clusters that range from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 7. Um, and I think at that point, it will become very interesting to look at, at the ISM. So even though we can't resolve you know, the multi-phase structure in the sense of we can't get the, the cold phase, um, we do have, you know, this, we would have this warm ionized phase, we would have these hot bubbles, and, and we would be able to track things like the momentum input and how that changes over the course of the simulation. So. Still five yeah, yeah. Uh, far, yeah, it's still five parsecs, still five parsecs, right. Um, so, yeah, you so I think. Resolve, like, the bubbles on small scales, so you're yeah. <coughs> yeah, no, right, exactly. So that's what I'm saying. I think for the, for the warm, ionized, and hot phases of the ISM, it will be a very interesting thing to look at. Yeah. All right, any last questions? Okay, for an anecdote, because okay. I've waited <laughs> so long. Do you remember, Benson, when Brant dropped this at in Puerto Rico? Oh, yeah. So we had this night session, and you probably don't even know this, but we had this numerics at night session where we forced all of our participants to stay up until like midnight working. <laughs> and, it, and it was like only the hardcore numericists like at this session, and Brant just gets up there, and that time Eagle was still being done, and people were still analyzing it, Arepa was like just new and everything, and, uh, and Brant's just like, uh, GPUs are going to destroy all of you, boom. And we were all just like, who is this Evan Schneider? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's the anecdote. Like, so that's when I came back to raving and raving I see, about it. I see. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, Brant has always been a, a strong advocate of my work, I'll say. So that's, yeah, gratifying to hear. But GPUs are awesome, and, and that's, I think that's the takeaway from this. So. All right, let's All right. thank you. Thank you.